recording and I tried the mic before and the mic was working so the mic should be working with this. I wish th wish there was a little indicator on there that showed the mic the mic doing something. All right, so today we're going to talk about measurement of ionizing radiation. What do you guys think? Why do you guys think um, measuring ionizing radiation is difficult? What what do you think makes it difficult? Yes, what's your opinion? If you think of Radiation. Well, obviously, we all know that you can't see radiation, right? Like you can see light. It's a form of light. It's a high energy form of light. So you can't see it. I mean, if you could see it, you know, people could stay away from it and see it. Oh, it's, there's a beam over there. Don't go into the beam. Um, but you can't see it. So we have to have some way of, of measuring it, putting an instrument in, in the field and measuring it. And I think that's partly why people are so afraid of radiation because you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't hear it. So um, it's up to us to know how to measure it and to. You know, there could be a, there could be a beam since you can't see it. You don't know the intensity of it. I mean, if it, with regular light, if you can see it's really bright, you don't look into it. But with radiation, we have to have instruments that can measure its intensity and its location. So, what what do you think are the challenges in measuring? How how do you think you would measure radiation if you had to measure it? What would you do? Just take a guess. I mean, I'm just I want to get some <coughs> feedback. More about the effects it causes, right? Mm -hmm. Like biological effects. Yeah. Yeah. So it causes biological effects. So you can measure it by looking at biological effects, and that's actually how people treated when when radiate when uh, when they started discovering <coughs> discovered radiation. They they realized it could be used for medical. They uh, they said, well, just you know, you've got something here. Let's treat it with this new X-ray or Röntgen ray. They called them Röntgen rays back then. And uh, and he said, let's treat it until it gets red. And that's when we'll stop, you know. Or and then as as uh, the field progressed, they said, well, we can go a little further. We can go and, and you know beyond beyond the point where it gets red. So yes, biological reaction was one way of, of uh, determining whether there was radiation there. What's another way besides biological? <coughs> How else? Well, you can measure a charge difference by passing through having it ionized. Material collecting the ions. Exactly. We know it ionizes material. It ionizes air. <coughs> uh, it's hard to collect ions in solid matter because it it does ionize solid matter, but it's hard if you put electrodes between it. Do those ions will they drift to the electrodes? You know, they're not going to drift that easily. Uh, there are instruments like diodes that do that, that are solid, uh, but in general, it's Besides dyes, it's difficult to measure. So okay, so we know we can ionize air and, and uh, collect those ions somehow. Okay, so that's a, that's another good. <coughs> thing. Air. What are other ways besides air and biological? Have you guys heard of TLDs, thermal luminescent dosimeters? Yeah. Okay, so that's another way of measuring it. We're going to go into more detail into TLDs, but we can just introduce them. Uh, so TLDs are after you after you radiate them. They store this charge in their crystal structure, and then if you heat them, they'll give off this energy as a, in the form of heat. Uh, sorry, in the form of light. Okay, and then you can measure the light. So that's another one. Um, also, there's a nut, there's a couple more. There's how about calorimetry? Okay, so calorimetry I mentioned uh, quickly in one other in another lecture. Calorimetry is the measurement of the increase in heat. Okay, because radiation imparts energy, and energy is a form of, and heat is a form of energy. So you can measure the difference in heat. In, in a material. Uh, so those are some of the major ones. What else? Uh, yeah, hey, those are those are some of the major ones. Okay. So here's uh, first. Let's talk about the free air ionization chamber. Free air ionization chamber. This is a schematic of, of what it looks like. Now you will not see these in the clinic. They're big. You know, they're usually they're maybe a meter, meter. It's a cubic meter, uh, and they're used mostly to measure uh, measure exposure, okay, not dose, we're measuring exposure with this, with this uh, ionization chamber. <coughs> and uh, the reason it's so big is because there's a condition that needs to be met when you're measuring exposure in an ionization chamber. And that condition is that all the charges that you collect in here, well first, before I get into the condition, let's explain what the schematic is. And this is, um, there's two plates, there's two Plates is an electrode up here, and there's an electrode down here. This is the collecting electrode, and then the guard electrode is on either side. And this collecting <coughs> electrode, if you're lo looking straight down, is probably circular. 
and the guard electrode is, in, or is a ring around it. Okay? And the purpose of the guard electrode is to define the collecting volume. So the collecting electrode is connected to an electrometer. The guard electrode goes to ground. Is it obvious that it goes to ground? No, but it, it does go to ground. So the ions that are collected, the ions that get formed out here, oh man, what did I just do? The ions that get formed in this area, I think I, may, I might have double tapped, yeah, that's what it is, Same learning stuff. Um, they just, they go to the, the guard electrode and they go to ground and they don't get measured. Okay, so all the stuff that's happening here and here doesn't get measured. It's only the ions that get created here that drift to these plates that actually get measured. And this plate is the polarizing plate and it has a high voltage applied to it. Okay, and the, so the collecting volume is all of this. So the, the condition to measure exposure is that, uh, I'm going to use the mouse to point to stuff, is that all the ions created in here uh, the, 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 uh, the ions that are created, any part of this, have to be collected by the collecting electrode. So, um, and this has to be long enough so that the, so that if they ch if they get created at this end and they travel through, uh, they have to be they have to be end their trajectory at at this end. So if they end their trajectory here, your collection ratio is going to drop. Okay, so you want to maximize your collection ratio, and that is by <coughs> ensuring that this distance is larger than the maximum range of the electrons you're trying to create. Okay, and that's that condition is called electronic equilibrium. Now there are some uh, some ions that are created here that enter the space. Okay, there are some ions that are created here that exit the space, but that's a balance. Okay, so there are just as many ions that come from here that enter here that are created that that are created here that exit, okay? Uh, so as long as this distance is equal to or larger than the maximum range of electrons, you're going to maximize your collection and, um, and you can use the equations correctly. So the free ionization chamber is not useful any longer since chamber calibrations have migrated to dosing water. So now after explaining all that, people tend not to use this too often because this gives you a reading of exposure. We don't use exposure anymore because we, we've moved to water. Uh, but we still have to understand how this works. Uh, all electron energy must be spent in the length L, in this, this um, distance right here. Okay, a 3 MeV electron in air, the range of a 3 MeV electron in air is 1.7 grams per centimeter cubed, or 1.41 meters. Okay, so if you're measuring three MeV electrons, this distance has to, has to be 1.4 meters. That's pretty big. That's like, what is that? That's like five feet. Okay, it's pretty big. So that's why this chamber has to be so large, because you, you need to collect all those electrons. Uh, and the problem with making it larger and larger, you could just keep making these things bigger and increase your electron energy if you want to collect electrons beyond this energy. The problem with that with making these chambers bigger is that your electric field uh, uniformity starts to drop as you get bigger and bigger. So you lose your uniformity of the electric field and as we know there's an electric field between these plates that that uh, is responsible for the force that's that's applied to the to the um, ions as they go to the plates. So we want an even electric field here so that they don't so that they don't um, so that they all experience the same force. So uh, and then there are corrections that you have to make. You have to make corrections for the air attenuation uh, because the ones that are created here are going to have less attenuation than the ones that are created here. Uh, more attenuation, rather, because they've gone through more air. You've got to correct for a recombination, and we all know what recombination is, right? That's when an ion pair gets created, and instead of going all the way to the plate, it recombines with another ion, okay, and gets lost. So a recombination is not a good thing. Uh, then we have to correct for temperature and pressure of the air because the air density of the air will affect how many ions you, you uh, create. And we have to also correct for ionization from scatter. Okay, so scatter, scatter can come from areas outside of this beam. So scatter can come from um, scattering off the walls of, this, of the box, for example. Okay. All right, so that's the, now they have these in calibration labs. So remember those labs I talked about where you send your chamber to get calibrated? They have, they have these free air chambers in the, in the calibration labs. And remember TG51? There's also TG21, the older protocol. Well, in TG21, the, 
you sent your chamber out when you were doing when we were doing TG twenty one. We sent our chamber out to the Cal Labs, and our calibration factor was in uh, Runkin's per <coughs> okay, So back then they were using this to calibrate the beam. Okay, so how do they use this? Well, they have a cobalt sixty beam, and they use this thing and bring it into the cobalt sixty beam to measure the to measure the exposure accurately. When they know that exposure, then they move it out of the way and they put your chamber in there. Okay, so they use that to measure the exposure of that cobalt 60 beam accurately. Um, today, uh, we today they have it, the um, the chamber is in water, so they don't they don't use this anymore. Okay, so moving on, thimble chamber. So this is the most common type of chamber used in radiation therapy. You guys have seen the thimble chamber already. We we used it when we were doing that calibration the other night. It's constructed. It can be constructed of air-like material. Now, what's air-like material? Air-like material is a material that if you take a whole bunch of air and you compress it down to uh, a very small thickness that forms the wall of the chamber, that's what we call air wall, air wall material. Okay? So it's a certain kind of plastic that scatters like air would scatter if you had compressed it all the way down. Okay? And there's a reason we do that. Uh, the chamber response versus energy should be flat, which means that if uh, if you measure a certain number, of, if you measure um, if you measure a certain number of Runkins for an energy of 500 kV, and then you you increase your energy, but you keep your exposure the same. Say you increase your energy to 2 MeV from 500, you've quadrupled it, but you're going to keep the intensity the same your chamber should measure the same exposure. So it should not have any energy dependence. Should not, an ideal chamber should not. Okay, that's a desirable uh, characteristic of a chamber. The effective atomic number should have a low average Z. Um, increase for so the, the Z, the average Z of the chamber should, be, should stay low. If Z increases, <laughs> it's gonna increase your photoelectric effect and it's now gonna introduce an energy dependence, especially at low energies. So we wanna keep Z low to reduce the, photo, the photoelectric effect. And the photoelectric effect is gonna increase the energy dependence down at, at lower energies. I think I have a graph we'll show it to you in a second. Uh, chamber response versus wall thickness. So that's another thing, if, the, if your wall is too thick, it's going to attenuate your photons, right? If it's too thin, um, you're not going to have enough photons interacting in the wall. You actually, the fo the the uh, electrons that you collect inside the air chamber come from the photons that interact in the wall. That's an assumption assumption that we have to make when we're when we're doing the equations. So if it's too thin, there won't be enough photons interacting in the wall, and your signal will be low. If it's too thick, it's going to attenuate your photons. And then another thing is that the chamber volume should be large enough to obtain a signal much larger than background noise levels. All right, so the chamber volume itself, there's a certain number of molecules available for ionization in this volume. If you decrease the volume, you keep making it smaller and smaller, now your signal is going to be very low, and that could be comparable to the noise introduced by your chamber. So your signal to noise ratio is going to be low, which means that the chamber is not really useful because it's just because your noise is competing with your signal. Uh, and then your response should not be directionally dependent. So that means that if your chamber, if you position your chamber um, sideways, you should get those same responses position pointing up relative to the relative to a beam. So those are all there's a whole list in con uh, of desirable <coughs> characteristics. So more characteristics. It's desirable to have minimal polarity effects. Remember polarity? You guys were switching polarity all the time. And I, I rotated you through those stations so you all get, get an idea of what the different things were, what, what uh, the important parts of every station. So it's desirable to have minimal polarity effects. And um, you don't want a chamber that's going to, let's see, do I have that? Okay, it's on another slide. You don't want a chamber that's going to measure very high for positive and, and very low for negative and vice versa. Okay, so low polarity effects, then stem effect. The stem effect is a signal that, the signal, in general, the signal is assumed to come from the, the, cham the chamber, the uh, sensitive volume of the chamber. And, uh, and the equations are, the equations assume that that's where all the signal is coming from. So if there's signal coming from outside of there, that's <coughs> introducing a perturbation to your signal. Okay, 
So this quality is undesirable and can be determined through a series of measurements in a radiation beam. And Khan has a, Khan, there's a procedure in Khan how to do that. And basically what you do is you set up, you set up a rectangular field and you orient your chamber this way in the field, so this is the sensitive volume. And then you ro and then you take a reading, and then you rotate, and this is the stem down here, by the way. And then you rotate your chamber, and you shoot it again. Okay. Now, this field and this field at the central axis should produce the same dose. Just assume your chamber is in water, right? and you're radiating on the chamber in water. This field and this field, they're both rectangular, the same field size, they should produce the same dose. But if the chamber reads a different dose, then you can attribute it to a stem effect. Okay, because in this in this field, in the red field, the stem's getting irradiated, and the black one, the stem is not getting irradiated. So if you get a lower reading in that with the black field, then you know there's some some type of stem effect happening. Okay. Um, all right, and then guard, go, moving on to the guard or guard electrode, I introduced it before, but it has two features. Number one, it prevents, it prevents the measurement of current uh, leakage by providing a path to ground. <coughs> prevents measurement of current leakage, yeah. So again, I'm going to draw that. I'm going to draw that guard electrode for you again. Here's the guard, here's the collector and guard. So guard, collector, guard. And then the polarizing electrode was at the top. And this is the one that has the bias. That's bias. Lots of volts. OK, so if uh, you're, pl you're applying a high voltage on here, there's always a little bit of leakage in any system, especially a chamber where there's, there's plastics. And so there could be some leakage between this electrode and this electrode, if you look at the construction of the chamber, just through the plastic and, and through the casing. Okay, so that leakage, if you provide, <coughs> and the, guard, the guard is grounded, if you provide an easy path for that leakage, the leakage will, will preferentially go, to, go through the guard electrode rather than, uh, rather than going through the collector because that leakage is not, is not current that you're getting from your ionizations. Okay, so the collector is a little bit further than the guard from ground. So things will tend to go, want to go to the ground, the easiest path. So that's one thing. It provides a path for the for the leakage in the system. Uh, it also it also prevents any arcing. If there's going to be an arc for some reason, uh, it prevents arcing through here. The arc will preferentially go through the guard because it's closer to ground. And then also it defines the collecting volume. Again, you'll you'll see once we start getting into Bragg gray cavity that that uh, knowing what that volume is is very important, and it defines that volume. So if we didn't have the guard electrode. What would that do? It's huh? an easy way to erase with my finger. If we didn't have a guard electrode, okay, and it looked like this, and I'm going to connect these. Well, the electric field lines in here, in the center, are pretty straight. Okay, they're pretty straight. But as you go off to the sides, you guys remember what happens to the electric field uh, at the end of an electrode. It kind of bows up, doesn't it? It does this. And so, uh, so then you won't know, you wouldn't know the, the exact volume of this chamber because you have this uncertainty in the electric field lines. Okay, so there's an uncertainty in the volume there. So by placing the guard electrode, you can define, um, you can <coughs> define your volume very accurately when you're constructing your chamber. And then this, here's, a, here, oh, here's a little diagram of the electric field lines. So the field lines, here's a collecting electrode in the thimble chamber. This is the wall or the polarizing electrode. And the electric field lines are pretty strong and straight out here. But out here, they start to deviate a little bit. Okay, so the collecting volume <coughs> is this volume with the hash lines right in there. Okay. <coughs> okay, can this, you got a, you got a cold? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you get your flu shot? No, no. No, I don't get flu shots. No. Every time I get a flu shot, I catch the flu. Yeah. Uh, condenser chambers. Oh, <coughs> I have one in the department. I'll go grab one. When we take a break, I'll go grab one. Uh, we start to 910? Okay. In about 10 minutes, we'll take a break. So condenser chambers are the early chambers. And 
again, this is these are chambers where we're using ionizations inside air to collect charges. Okay, they work the same way. Uh, the way they work is that they were charged up, and so they didn't have any cables, and they weren't collecting electrometers. They were just this metal, and I have some, I'll bring some. They were this metal tube that you charged up, and it was basically a big capacitor. You charged it up like a capacitor, and then you took it, had a sensitive volume, and took it and put it in a radiation field. You irradiate it. What happens if you take a capacitor that's charged up and you irradiate it? Well, all the air is going to create ions, and those ions are going to neutralize the charge that you just charged. Okay, so now you're subtracting charge. Then you put it back in the charger slash reader, the charger and reader with the same device. Put it back in the charger slash reader, and then the reader is going to it's going to measure how much charge is left. And actually, it measures the voltage difference across it. It measures the voltage difference, and then it tells you how many bronchins it's been exposed to. Okay, that's how the early ones worked. So the difference in charge, there should be a space there, was proportional to the exposure. Okay, and so, uh, so this equation just shows that the charge, uh, the charge liberated in air is this value. You're going to see this value a lot. 2.5 A times 10 to the minus 4 coulombs per kilogram per bronchin times the exposure that the chamber was exposed to times the um, air density correction uh, times the chamber Oh, sorry, times the air density, times the chamber volume. See, this is why you know, I keep saying that it's important to know the chamber volume, because it shows up in the equations. Uh, and that's equal to the charge collected. So uh, obviously the volume is important, because the more volume there is, the more charge you're going to collect. So it has to be part of the equation. And the voltage drop across this device, uh, um, the voltage is equal to the charge divided by the capacitance is equal to 3.33 times 10 to the minus 4 times the exposure times the uh, volume per um, volume per volume per what is that volume per times the volume per oh per, per capacitance so you need to know the capacitance of the device that acts as the separation Oh, sorry. You know, there's too many x's in that yeah, equation. There's x, x, x. This is times. Right. And the big x? And the big x is this exposure. Okay. Total oh, exposure. Right. And then these aren't used anymore? No. I mean, you can still use them. They still work. <coughs> but they're not used anymore. They're not very accurate. The sensitivity is really low. Yeah. You'll see when I show you how you read them. It's just, you put them in the reader and you look at it. You have to look through this thing and there's a light and there's a scale in Runkin. It's kind of like using a ruler that, you know, the best division is one centimeter and you're trying to measure millimeters. It's just, it's not very sensitive. You'll see in a, in a minute. Okay, and then we're moving on. Then the, the farmer chamber came around. So it's, this is when uh, chambers started getting a little more uh, precise. And this is the air and farmer chamber, uh, uh, one of the other, it's an improvement on the original farmer chamber. <coughs> this. The idea behind this chamber is that it had a flat energy response. Okay, so it was pretty flat across the board, except for really low energies. <coughs> and the way it's constructed, this is the wall. The wall is made of acrylic. Okay, so this is acrylic. The inside of the wall has graphite coated onto it. And the graphite is a conductor. Okay, so it works, so we can use it as an electrode. Okay, and actually, I made, a lot of, I made a lot of chambers when I was doing my master's research. Not this kind, I made plain parallel chambers. And I, you know, I spent so much time painting this graphite on these chambers, and um, it's it's a big mess. And you know, and I did this manually, so my electrodes were kind of like there was a lot of graphite in some areas and not in others. I didn't have a like I didn't evaporate it on there like these are these graphite uh, electrodes are evaporated up to the acrylic, and they're a lot more accurate. But graphite does conduct, and uh, and it can be used as an electrode. And the center electrode in this chamber is aluminum. Which is a little surprising because we said that we said that we don't want any Heise material in chambers because it increases the photoelectric effect. But it seems to work. The aluminum is very thin. It's a it's a one millimeter electrode. And uh, and okay, so the shell is the shell is nylon. So if you touch this, you won't get electrocuted because the outside is is acrylic. Okay, it's just the inside that has the graphite. Okay, and then the uh, this is the these are the guard electrodes. Oh, it should say. It should say guard electrode right here. Oh, it does. You can kind of see it, but it's a different. It's a white color. So, uh, so these are guard electrodes right here, and then this is uh, this is kind of like Teflon PTCFE out here, which is an insulator. 
Okay. And then you've got the dimensions on there. Okay. Pop question. What would happen to the energy dependence of this chamber if the electrode is made of lead instead of aluminum? So let's let's talk about energy dependence. That's not a good place to draw here. Energy dependence. So here's energy, and here's and here's response. Okay. Response is like <coughs> reading. What reading would you get? Okay. So what would happen to what would this curve look like if if um, well first of all let's draw the curve of this <coughs> device with the aluminum, and it kind of looks like this. Okay, and the energy out here, I mean, we're talking about photons that are maybe 20 MeV. We're not, you know, we're not going to go that much higher because that's that's kind of our top end when we want to treat our patients. And down here, you know, maybe 10 keV. So the energy response looks like that. And this little dip is because of, probably because there's some aluminum in there, okay? And down here, this is the photoelectric effect. Okay, so the response is a little higher because we're now we're not seeing photoelectric effect down here. So what would happen if we go to lead? Lead is higher Z, right? Yeah. No. Well, what, what would that curve look like? Your down curve would be longer. This one? Yeah. So, so what it would look like, uh, you mean longer like this? Would it join up? Or would it just would it do this? What do you think? <coughs> I, I think it would join up. Yeah. yeah? Yeah, I think it'll join up. I think it'll join up because let because now you're in the Compton effect. And Compton is the same across all uh, all materials. So it would join up. Yeah. So it would be higher up here, much higher actually, because of the difference between aluminum, the Z difference between aluminum and lead is huge. So well, this eraser doesn't work too well. Maybe it's just me. So it's a technique. Yeah, I'd be up, I'd be up here like this. Something like that. So it'd be much higher. Okay. Uh, this, those are some examples of farmer chambers. This one we used at the clinic. This is an Xrad. Xrad is a company that it's important for you guys to know these names, get used to these names, because you're gonna hear them a lot. And even model numbers, you're going to start seeing them. When people ask you what chamber you've used, it's good that you know that you can say, I've used an A12, or I've used an A16, or I've used an A1SL, or whatever. Uh, so Xeriden is a company that makes a lot of chambers. Their chambers are uh, all made of either tissue equivalent material or air equivalent. Um, and and what, what I mean by equivalent, it's a plastic that, that, the, t that the plastic scatters like tissue. <coughs> okay, so. Um, so the chambers don't have any, they really don't have any metal in them. So, so their energy dependence is pretty flat. The farmer chamber, this is all aluminum out here. And again, there's that, it looks gray because of the graphite coating and the inter, inside coating. Okay. And this is a PTW. PTW is another company. They're German, Xraden, they're American. Actually, the founder of the Xraden company is from the area. His name's John Spokus. And he had his own little company and then he made chambers. And then his company was bought out by Standard Imaging. And now they're, they're a much bigger company and they do more marketing. So they're the ones that are selling his chambers now. Excellent chambers. And they're not expensive. The PTW, the construction, it's got that nice German construction. It just looks like it's so well machined. Um, and they're, they're, yeah, they're excellent chambers too. They're a lot more expensive than X-Rad. And then there's, here's the x and pa plain parallel chamber, the P11 chamber. So this is a thimble chamber, a thimble chamber, and this is a plain parallel chamber. Plain parallel is when the electrodes are one on top of the other, like the drawings I was drawing before. Okay. And uh, we use the, X, the two x radins for when we were doing TG control. We used that one. We didn't use this one. I, we used a parallel plate at one point, didn't we, for profiling? Mm, no, we use a scanning chamber, a small volume scanning chamber. Mm -hmm. okay. But these ch these pa plane parallel chambers are used mostly for electrons. Okay. Okay, and there's just some schematics on what the why are the bad schematics? I gotta redraw these at some point. So this is a thimble chamber, and um, so the polarizing electrode is the outer electrode, and here's the collecting the, the inner one, 
uh, and then the guard. When you guys flip polarity, when you go to minus and plus, all you're doing is you're making the bias, you're making the collecting electrode bias, and you're making the uh, polarizing electrode ground. That's what you're doing when you're flipping plus and minus. <coughs> okay, and then here's this the plane parallel, which I've already drawn a couple of times. And over here is just a schematic of what the triax cable looks like. The central, if you look at the, the male end of the triax cable, the central electrode is the collecting electrode, and that's where the signal is. And the signal needs to be in the center because it needs to be shielded. So remember, we collect very, very small signals, so we need to make sure we're shielded so that the, chain, so that the cable doesn't act like an antenna and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't absorb signals from ambient signals, right? I mean, there's signals that are all over the place around us. Uh, and then the second electrode is the polarizing electrode. That's usually where the, where the, um, the biases apply to. And then the outer electrode is that actually you hold that. That's the metal piece that you hold, and that's the shielding. And that's connected kind of to ground. Okay, so you shouldn't get a shock. You will get a shock, though, if you, un if you unhook it and you put your finger on the end of this. You'll feel it because of the polarizing electrode. You'll, you'll feel the 300 volts. It's not very pleasant. Did I go two slides or one? Let's see. One, okay. And then the electrometer, all right. So you guys have used electrometers. Well, how, how are they used? They're used as current meters in this one. If you push this I, that's current, you're gonna use it as a current meter. They use this charge meters to integrate. So if I, if I push the uh, Coulomb button, it'll, it'll measure charge. Polarity can be varied or inverted. So it can be varied. Usually you'll have a, um, a 0%, 50%, 100%. Sometimes you'll have 0, 20, 40, and steps of 20%. So you can vary the polarity that's applied to, sorry, you can vary the bias that's applied to your, to your cable. And then the readings are greatly amplified. That's one of the jobs of the electrometer. And usually the electrometers are, are battery operated and, has a, and they have a chopper circuit. So how do, they, how do you apply 300 volts <coughs> from, from uh, an electrometer? If it's not plugged into the wall, there's no transformer. The 300 volts comes from um, an electronic device called a chopper. So it starts, it starts with a, a low, DC, low DC voltage. And then there's a, a um, an alternating circuit in there that converts it to a square wave. And then that square wave can be amplified. And that's amplified up. And then it's brought down again and it's rectified again down to a DC. And so it becomes, it becomes a low voltage, starts with a low voltage DC, then it becomes amplified to a pseudo AC voltage. And then it goes back down to, uh, not down, it, it gets converted to a DC voltage at a high voltage. It converts DC to AC, amplifies it, then converts it back to DC, back to DC for a 300 volt bias. And actually, I used to use an electrometer that didn't have an amplifier, and it was pure. I had batteries that were like, like 90 volts each. And there was a whole bunch of them in there, 90 volt batteries. Those are hard, really hard to find. Okay, let's take a break here. I'll go get those chambers. So what's an electrometer? What makes it? What makes it? How does it amplify those signals? So uh, it's such high gain. So it uses primarily op amp circuits. You've all heard of op amps. They look like we've done labs with op amps. They look like little tiny chips, right? Uh, I think it has the most common one is like the 741 with six, with six uh, six connectors on a three on each side. And um, they're very simple devices. They're made with a bunch of transistors. And so these are the three main circuits that we use in that in our electrometers. The basic function of an op amp is to give you gain to amplify the signal, and the gain is defined as the signal out. Signal so, you know, comes out of it divided by the signal in, and the signal in is low because it, I'm doing this. I'm pointing like it's a projector. And the signal that's coming in the uh, into the op amp is a signal that comes from the chamber, and we all know that that's low because it's just the number of ions that are being created in the air, and that's very low low number relatively, relative. So um, uh, so this is a typical connection for an integrate, integrating electrometer. So the signal comes in, uh, the signal is charged, it charges, charges up this capacitor, 
and the current that you measure is equal to the capacitance of the capacitor times the voltage that you read out. Okay, so that's an integrate mode. And then there's the rate mode. Okay, this is when you're measuring current. The voltage that you read out on the electrometer is equal to the current that comes in from the chamber times, uh, times the resistor. And then this is, a, this is a dose meter where you can actually measure, measure the, the charge that's coming into the electrometer. And then with, with a variable resistor, which is indicated by this part right here, this is a variable resistor, you can vary what's being read out here okay, by varying this resistor. So say, for example, uh, you know that the radiation field is 100 um, millirunken per hour, for example, just to throw a number out because you know that because you calibrated it with a calibrated chamber. Well, then you bring this device in. This would, be, this would be an electrometer, obviously. You bring this device in, and you hook your chamber up to it. And if you know it's 100 MR per hour, you can, you can vary. There's a knob on the electrometer where you can tweak until you read 100 MR per hour on your voltmeter. Okay, it's a very old electrometer. Today's electrometers don't allow you to do that. But I've used one that you can do that. There's a little <coughs> it's basically you're, what you're doing is you're varying your calibration factor right on the electrometer. Okay. So in the old days, that's how we did things. Okay, so that's a very that's a variable calibration factor electrometer. Okay, so those are the three main uh, configurations. All right, let's move on to collection efficiency. Uh, uh, okay, so collection efficiency has to do with how many ions the chamber is able to collect. And obviously different chambers, based on the construction and the size of them, are going to be able to collect more ions or less ions okay, for, a given, for a given exposure rate. Okay. So it, is it important to collect? <coughs> you want to collect as many ions as possible, right? Because that will increase your signal to noise ratio. So you want to, co you want to construct a chamber that has the ability to collect a lot of ions. So the number of ions collected increases with dose rate. Right? So if you put a chamber in a field, no matter what the collection efficiency of the chamber is, if you increase your dose rate, you're going to get a higher signal. Okay? That's obvious. Saturation occurs when the collection current remains constant while increasing bias voltage. <coughs> so you know, we typically apply 300 volts on our chambers. Well, what happens if we increase that to 400, to 500, 600, 700? Will we, will we increase? Will we keep increasing our collection? Will we keep increasing our signal as we do that? No. There comes a point where it flattens out, okay, where you don't collect any more ions uh, by increasing the bias voltage. Okay, and then, and you'll learn in your health physics class that as you as you keep increasing that, it flattens out, <coughs> and then you don't collect any more ions. Uh, you, you always collect the same number, no matter what the voltage is. I mean, it's still. It's still useful because you're collecting a certain number of ions, and that's proportional to the to the dose rate. Okay, uh, but increasing your voltage will not give you more. Once you go beyond that, and I mentioned that when we were doing TG51, once you go beyond that and you start applying more voltage, you get into the Geiger region, and that's when you're actually accelerating the ions in the air. You create, you're accelerating them. You're no longer just having them drift to the plates. Now they're accelerating, and they're colliding with other ions, and they're creating ions. So they themselves are creating ions. And it creates the avalanche effect, and that's the Geiger region. <coughs> Most of our chambers are used in the proportional region, this region right here, or even this region. Okay. So, uh, so this graph shows you. This graph shows you uh, the ion current that your chamber collects versus the chamber voltage that's applied to the to the to the chamber. Okay. So obviously, if you, as your chamber voltage goes up from zero, as your voltage goes up, you're going to start collecting more ions because they feel uh, they'll feel force and they'll be uh, it'll start drifting to the plates. And if your voltage is low, why do you think that if your voltage is low, you're not going to collect as many ions here as you are up here? If your voltage is low, what's keeping you from collecting all the ions? That's the recombination. Exactly, you're they're recombining. So they feel a little force; they're getting tugged over, but they're just they're slow. They're drifting over slowly. They're taking their time, and they go, "Hey, there's another one. Here. I'm going to recombine with this guy." So the probability of combination is higher for a lower voltage. As your voltage goes up, the probability goes down because they, they start to gain speed. Therefore, the, the probability of them combining is lower because they're just moving right by the other ions. Um, and pulse think, OK, so let's look at this. So we know that as we increase our dose rate, it's going to increase our current. And okay, that makes sense. 
uh, if we increase our, but look at, <coughs> look at for, the, for, for a particular dose rate, the saturation current comes sooner, okay, for, for a certain dose rate. Okay. Okay, so now pulse and continuous radiations have different collection efficiency equations. Okay, so the collection efficiency is treated differently for the two. Okay, so we're going to look at those in a second. All right, now there's this smart fellow called Bold, that's his last name. He came up with an ion collection efficiency equation. And uh, that's, what we, that's what we tend to, to follow. And this is just a summary, just <coughs> basic, this is like this, his final results, a very place may very simply, you're going to cover this in more detail with, uh, when you do your course with Johns and Cunningham. So basically, it comes down to this. Fraction collected for a particular um, plate voltage, for a set voltage, and for a particular uh, charge collected per second per cc, that's the fraction collected uh, on, a, on a parallel plate chamber. So this is a, a representation of two plates, polarizing plate and collecting plate, okay? And then D is the distance apart, that's how far these plates are. So, so the fraction collected is this, what's C? So C is a, a value that's down here. C is a constant times the voltage across the plates divided by D squared, so it's heavily dependent, okay? It's heavily dependent on uh, the distance. <coughs> oh. Okay, heavily dependent on the distance, and it's also um, dependent on the square root of the collected charge per second per cc. Collected charge per second per cc. Okay, so there's where the volume of the chamber comes in. Okay, the cc part. The charge collected, there's a charge collected in per second. That's a rate. Okay. How quickly you're collecting it. Okay, all right, so how do we use this? So that describes the fraction collected for a particular chamber. So how do we use this for um, more common types of chamber in, in radiation therapy, such as the, the cylindrical chamber? We tend, we don't tend to use the plane parallel chamber too much. This describes, the reason that this describes the plane parallel is because it's very easy to, to calculate how quickly ions are drifting <coughs> across in a plane parallel chamber because it's a linear motion. So, uh, but what about a cylindrical chamber? So a cylindrical chamber, there's now, uh, there's a graph that gives you correction factors. Okay, so how do you go from collection efficiency with a plane parallel to collection efficiency with a cylindrical chamber? Well, this is how you do it. There's a correction factor. So what you're going to do is you're going to use this equation for a cylindrical chamber, but the D, we're going to correct the D. Okay, and here's how you correct the D. The D for a cylindrical chamber is equal to, um, let's see, so the D, is equal to D sub CYL <coughs> times this correction factor K sub CYL. Okay, and D sub CYL is A minus B. So what's A minus B? Here's a cross section of your cylindrical chamber. Okay, and the A and the B describe the, oh, this is like a stadium seat. The A and the B describe, A is the uh, inner radius from the center of the chamber to the uh, to the inner surface of the chamber wall, that's A, and B is the radius of the central electron. Okay? So you need to know what those two numbers are. And so that A minus B is DCYL, and then KCYL you read off the graph. Okay, that's what KCYL is. So uh, I would give you A over B, or I would give you A and B, you calculate A over B, and then from A over B, say A over B is 10. Okay, and you're using a cylindrical chamber, then you go up to this graph here, so your K is 1.2. Okay, so the D again is A minus B times 1.2, and that's your little d. Okay, so if I ask you what the collection, collection fraction for a cylindrical chamber is, you guys are going to need this graph because you have to look up your K, and you're going to need A and B. Okay, and then here's spherical. Some chambers are spherical in nature, so the collecting volume is a sphere. Then you'd use this graph here. What would you use if the chamber is plane parallel? Just the equation. Just the equation. Okay. Let's see. That's a simple case. Okay. So if A equals 0.5 and B is 0 0.05, uh, what is K sil for a uh, cylindrical chamber? And what is D? So can you guys give me those answers? 
So what's what's uh, what's capital K? First of all, what do you need? To so you need A over B, yeah. right? Okay. So what's A over B? A over B is 10. Okay. So A over B is 10. Oh, this is the example I just gave. <laughs> okay. And then so K still is 1.2. That's the one I just gave. All right. So it's, it's what I just gave. And D is 1.2 times what's A minus B? Don, what's A minus B? Ah, 0.45, right? Yeah. Okay, 0.45, so, so this little d is 0.45 times 1.2. What's uh, 0.45 times 1.2? I don't know, say 0.55 or something. Okay, so that would be d. Yeah. All right, cool. Oh, and this comes from, uh, this comes from John's and Cunningham, page 299. Have you guys had an opportunity to buy that yet? Oh yeah. oh yeah, oh yeah, I see it right there, yeah. Did you get it used? No. No, it's hard to find them used, huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> people, people like it. It's a like great it's book. It's yeah. an awesome book. Yeah, uh, okay, so uh, keep, we're going to keep talking about recombination. So PIN is a more modern uh, recombination coefficient. That, the first, the collection fraction and the correction, those are the kind of older ways of uh, correcting for recombination. Today, when we collect for recombination, we're doing usually doing TG51, okay? And so in TG51, or TG21, in TG21 and TG51, we're using these graphs that are provided in the protocol. So this graph comes from TG21, and uh, the way you calculate PI on is you, you measure Q1 and Q2. Q1 and Q2 are the charges that we collect with the two bias voltages. Remember the low bias and the high bias that we had? So Q1 is the um, uh, Q1 is the, let's see, high bias charge, and Q2 is a low bias charge. <coughs> so the high bias charge is going to be bigger than the low bias charge, so it's going to be bigger than 1. Okay? So we get our ratio for those, Q1 over Q2, and uh, that, those are usually really similar. So our ratio was like way down here somewhere. Okay, and then, then we look up the graph. There's three graphs. Pulse scanning beam, okay, now there are some older linear accelerators that uh, that scanned. They, they to create the photons. They scanned. They were scanning, and so we're not um, for electrons. And so to create a like a 15 by 15 field, it was like a raster. And the electron, there would be no scattering foil. The thing would just be bent. There was a there was a magnetic field that would move very quickly, and it would just scan back and forth. And that's how it would create the electron field. Uh, today the beams don't scan. They just hit a scattering foil. So. Uh, so we we're gonna we use this one the pulse radiation because our linear accelerators as we know create pulse radiation. We're, what's continuous? The cobalt sixty. Cobalt sixty is continuous, correct? Okay. So based on look at the difference, huge difference in collection efficiency, isn't there between one and the other? Um, the correction that you have to make for collection efficiency is a lot higher for pulse radiation, which means that our chambers are better at collecting continuous radiation than they are at collecting pulse radiation because you have to correct for it. Okay. PIN is a correction factor. So what PIN does is it, um, based on your measurements, it figures out how bad your chamber is and it corrects for that uh, inadequacy in your chamber. Okay. So if your PIN is really high, it means your, your chamber is collecting, is not collecting as many ions as if it's low. Okay. So for continuous radiation, PIN is pretty, pretty low, which means that uh, chambers uh, tend to collect more, more ions if it's continuous versus pulsed. Okay, so that's TG21. That's what you use in TG21. And then in 51, they said, well, look at this graph. Boy, that's almost linear. All right? Why are we making them read off this graph? It's, you know, people make mistakes when they read off the graph. Let's just give them a linear equation. So they gave us this equation. P ion for a particular voltage, say 300 volts, is equal to this. And so PIN depends on the high voltage you use, the low voltage. In our case, it was 300 and 150. That's what we used. And then the reading you get for the high voltage and the reading you get for the low voltage. Subtract that by the V high over V low squared. And that's your, that's your PIN for continuous or cobalt 60 beams. For pulsed, it's a little bit different. The only difference is that you're not, um, you're, you're not raising these to the power of 2. 
Okay, so this one gets raised. So this equation here, <coughs> this equation um, uh, follows this curve, and this equation sort of follows this curve as closely as we can get it. And they looked at the, they plotted this versus this, and apparently the error is something like 0.1%, 0.2%. You know, if you use that curve versus this, so it's negligible. So people will tend to make a lot less mistakes using an equation compared to reading reading off a graph, especially this graph. I mean, it's you know, it's hard to read off off a graph like that. Um, so I'll teach you 51, and then okay. So for pulse of swift beams, your PI needs to be less than 1.05. If it's more than 1.05, you got a bad chamber. You need to do something about the chamber. Send it to the cal lab. Have them look at it and uh, determine why it's more than 0.05. But your, um, your error starts to go up if it's more than 0.05. Okay, so those are recombination. We talked a lot about recombination and ion collection efficiency. Now moving to polarity effects. Polar the, the polarity effects are the effects that you get when you read one reading with one polarity and a different reading with another polarity. Okay, so that's a polarity effect. Ideal chamber, we're just going to give you the same reading. Okay, not all chambers are ideal. So we need to correct for it. And we correct for it with this equation. This is a TG, uh, is a TG51 equation. So it's your <coughs> reading with positive polarity minus your reading with negative polarity divided by two times your um, your MROM. Since this doesn't have a plus or a minus, this reading can be either this one or this one. You choose. You're going to say my MRA with no with no polarity is going to be my, either my positive or my negative. You choose it before you start taking your readings. Okay. People get confused about what's this? It's not this. It's not that. You're going to make that choice before you take your readings, and then you just have to stay consistent in the protocol. Okay, so changes in polarity within the chamber can yield different signals due to why are we getting different signals? Number one, Compton current due to high-speed electrons that create their own current and are affected by the electric field within the chamber. Okay, so if you have a here's the plane parallel chamber with an electric field, electric field E, and your elect electrons are coming in through the chamber, they could be interacting along the way. They have a, this electric field is gonna impart a force on these electrons. Okay? So it's either gonna slow them down or speed them up as they're coming through. If I flip this, I've just changed my polarity, I just changed my polarity, I'm gonna flip this. That's gonna affect the force that these electrons feel. So the electrons coming through the chamber, uh, that's, they call that a Compton current. It's kind of like a Compton current, because they form their own current. Electrons moving, moving electrons are, is a current, right? It's, it's Q per second. Uh, so as, they, as, they, as you flip your polarity, that current is gonna change, and that can affect, um, that can affect the, the current that you, that you collect. And then there's also extra cameral. Extra cameral means any current that's outside of your sensitive volume. Okay, extra cameral current. It's current due to ionization created outside the sensitive volume. So remember, there's a here's the ionization chamber. Okay, and then there's the there's the stem out here. Remember the stem. So if the if the electrons are being are interacting here, electrons and photons are interacting here. That's fine. You're reading those, but the radiation field is also interacting out here, and you know there's electrodes in here. So that field is creating ions in here, and those electrons those electrodes could be picking up some of that current too. That's extra cameral current also known as stem effect. So these effects, uh, these effects are affected by the polarity. Okay? Depending on the polarity of it, those effects either are higher or lower. Uh, they're also greater for electrons than photons. Mm -hmm. So if you measure a PDD with one polarity and then you measure a PDD again with a different polarity, on electrons you will definitely see a difference. Photons you won't see it so much. Uh, okay, so good chamber design should reduce these effects, can be minimized by taking readings at both polarities and using that correction factor. So the peephole should be less than 0.03%. So that's really low. Okay, so if not, send chamber to a cal lab for testing. So the polarity effects should be extremely low, 0.3%. Okay, moving on to environmental conditions now. So environmental conditions are basically three things. Temperature, pressure, and humidity. Okay? The two biggest things that affect the signal are temperature and pressure. Okay. Now, uh, I think, have I talked to you guys about temperature and pressure and how it affects the signal? Oh, yeah. Uh, I mentioned, do you remember what I said? Yeah. What did I say? 
how does that affect the signal? Increase or decrease. Increases or decreases, yeah. But why does it increase or decrease? Yeah, because it's a faster the air density. Uh huh. Where you you know you more molecules in or unit volume gives you a bigger signal. If there's more molecules, right? Yeah. And a certain volume gives you a bigger signal because you have more uh, um, the chances are higher that they're going to yeah. ionize because there's more of them. But why would there be more molecules in a particular volume? Okay, so higher air density means more or less? More, more. More, okay, more density. Okay, density is mass per volume, so there's more there's more uh, molecules per volume. Um, and so does temp an increase in temperature increase density or decrease temp density? Decrease. So, so I'm gonna increase my T, and that and what does that do to density? It, oh, it, decreases. it decreases my density if I increase? Yeah, so. So if you decrease my density, increase in temperature, what does that do to molecules? It moves them around more, right? They move more, they need more room, they're bouncing out, and they're pushing, pushing against each other. That means that there's less molecules in a particular space. What if I increase my pressure? Increase. increase my pressure, again, I'm packing it in, packing them in, so I'm gonna increase my density, okay? All right, so then we have to take that into account because from day to day, we know that environmental conditions are going to change, <coughs> pressure and temperature change, so we're going to correct that with this correction factor. Okay, the s and the reason we use 760 and 295, those are known as STP, standard temperature and pressure, um, basically the room, the room conditions, and uh, when we get our calibration factor from the Cal lab for our chamber, they normalize that factor to STP. Because they, I mean, they have a certain temperature and pressure in their own room when they're calibrating the chamber, and their readings are affected by what's in the room. And they can't. It's impossible to make a room that's always the same temperature and pressure. It would be very expensive to do that. Okay, especially the pressure part, right? And then so, so they normalize it to STP, so that when we get our chamber, we need to correct it to STP. So 760 is STP, and it's um, and that's in what units of these? What's Mercury. Millimeters of mercury. What are the kilopascal? You have to also remember the kilopascal. 101 point, see, I don't even remember. I think it's 101.15. One, one I think it's 101.15. One or 101 point. It's 101 point something, okay? Point question. Okay, kilopascals. Okay, temperature. Okay, so this is, what are the units here? Degrees Celsius, okay? But they're normalized to Kelvin. So 295 is room temperature of Kelvin, 273 is uh, um, zero degrees plus, uh, plus room temperature. Well, oh, sorry, plus whatever temperature is in your room. Okay. And typical, a typical KTP or CTP is going to be one point around here, 1.04, Chicago, typical. The pressure in Chicago is typically 745, and your room temperature is going to be around 21, 22. Okay, so we're going to correct for that. So look, it's it's higher, 1.04, so it's higher than 1. Um, well, that's just based on environmental conditions. Okay, the lastly, humidity. Humidity has a slight effect on your readings, um, but people tend not to correct for humidity because in the range of 20 to 80%, <coughs> 20 to 80% room humidity, it varies about 0.15%. So it's negligible, we don't have to worry about it. I mean, if you're, you know, if you're in Atlanta and it's really humid, it's 100%, 95%, you might want to think about it. Okay? <coughs> Remember, from 20 to 80, which is pretty typical, uh, we don't have to worry about it. Okay, so measurement of exposure. Is this the last slide? Yeah. Okay. Measurement. Of, so basically, when we measure exposure, we need certain things. And this is a general equation. Okay? It's not TG51 or 21. It's just a general equation. We need certain things. We need a measurement, reading in coulombs. We need an exposure calibration factor from the Cal Lab, and that factor typically is Runken per Coulomb. Okay, that's this guy. And so we have Coulombs here, and Coulombs here, and they cancel, so we end up with Runken. Great, now we have Runken, but we have to correct, right? We have correction factors. So air density correction, we just talked about with combination loss correction, and then stem leakage correction. Okay, so those are some correction factors, and um, combination air density. And then this can be this can be also P pole. And this is P ion. 
recombination loss question, yeah. And air density KTP. Okay, so that's just a general equation. Okay? And then next class we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to get into a little more depth in these equations and the, uh, the nitty gritty and the details on how to measure radiation. Okay, any questions? Intensity? Is air on the energy booms or intensity is a pretty general term. Okay, intensity can mean a lot of things. Oh, okay. But it, so if you're talking about <coughs> exposure, intensity of exposure is just higher intensity means higher bunking. Okay, intensity it could be intensity of dose. Um, what, what context did you did you hear it in? Intensity? Yeah. Just 